The sun has gone down at Hangman's Hill and the ghost at Misery Corner isn't walking tonight. So, welcome to the Weird Tales Radio Show, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, magic and folklore. And now, here's your host, writer, award-winning journalist, best-selling author and sometime werewolf hunter, Charles Christian. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Weird Tales radio show. My name's Charles Christian and I'm your host. And uh, the main event this time is part two of our interview with Naomi of the Anana's Magical Gifts in Norwich. But before we get on with that, here's a date to remember. 29th of April. According to some early English calendars, the 29th of April was the date that Noah left the Ark, having entered it on the 17th of March. And obviously, Noah is the reason, and his Ark is the reason why we have no unicorns, because they were playing happily on the shore and missed the boat. Anyway, here's part two, the concluding part of our interview. Just one final thing on your stock type mm. things. Hairs. Mm. What is it with hairs? I mean, I know <laughs> Jane over there likes hairs and paints hairs as well, but there, there's something about them and they appear to have been... Well, I mean, I know we've had them since Boudicca in. <laughs> they've been regarded as sacred. But what, what is it about hairs? Well, hanging up outside our hanging sign is a sleeping hair, again, made by a very talented craft maker in the in the region. Um, we must have many hundreds of different hair themed things here. And initially they were quite hard to find. Not many people had drawn them, painted them, sculpted them. There were not many things I could find. Now I've managed to track down a lot. What is it with hairs? Well, certainly, yes, here in East Anglia, as you say, Boudicca's association of honouring the goddess Andrasta. Uh, this we know from Cassius Dio's History of Britain, um, that Boudicca would release a hair and see which way it ran and try and ascertain from that which way uh, a course of action or a battle might unfold. So Andrasta, a goddess of victory, invincible uh, qualities, um, I would imagine, and we don't have a lot of information, a, a, a kind of Bellona figure in some ways, perhaps, strategy and tactic in, in war, um, analytical, projecting forwards, planning, and being able to adjust one's course very quickly, as anyone who's seen a hare running in the fields knows. Mm. They can dart one direction yeah. and then dart another on a, on a hare's breadth, on a, on a grass blade's <laughs> breadth. Yeah. So... What is interesting is, of course, that they are sacred in many cultures. So you look at Freya, you look at Ixchel in uh, Mexico, uh, a goddess who is associated with weaving and spinning and is often depicted with a hair by her side. Um, you can even trace perhaps a path from African stories of wise hairs and trickster hairs traveling across to America and becoming the Bra Rabbit stories. Again, artful, elusive, hard to pin down, wrigglesome, clever, brainy, using planning and strategy when you can't use brawn because you don't have it. How do you outwit? How do you stay ahead of the game? Even Bugs Bunny could mm -hmm. f fall into that category outwitting yeah. and planning. But the moon connection, I think, is where people often find um, meaning and mystery. And that comes up in uh, Chinese and Japanese tradition. Mochi is the rice bowl and also is the full moon. And the rice bowl is stirred by the moon hair. When the moon is full, that is what you're seeing. And also to see that in the face of the moon that we see at full moon, that it's not a human face, but a curled up sleeping hair. So there are hair deities in Egyptian and uh, Celtic and Nordic, various kinds, and South American and um, tribal mm -hmm. traditions wherever they are found. And I think for many people, 
they are a representation of wildness, of not being able to be controlled, of moving with the moon and transforming that ancient design of the three hairs chasing each other in a circle, each sharing an ear. So you have that triple mm -hmm. hair design where they're all linked. It looks like each has two ears, but when you look at it, it's mm -hmm. actually one linked to the next yes, ear and the that, next and the next. The card just in my line of sight. That's that. it, that's it, exactly. So there is that idea of cyclical flow, of moon magic and transformation, of seeing and not seeing, of things being hidden and revealed. And, and I think today, particularly since hares are not nearly as protected by law as they should be, and I know many people are trying to have better laws to protect against hideous things like hair coursing, um, the hare represents that within us where we need wildness and we need freedom and we need untouched nature and to be able to hide ourselves in nature to be able to as the hair does just be still and not be seen and become part of nature and i think that's another aspect particularly um with the history of magic is mm -hmm. if you look at the testimony of interrogated women such as isabel gaudi who said when um she was being uh questioned as to her magical activities she said i shall go into a hare so this idea of women transforming into hares at times gave matthew hopkins which find a general mm -hmm. <laughs> spit um the idea that if you could catch and torture a hare that as it died it would turn back into the woman who was eluding mm -hmm. capture and interrogation for witchcraft. So I think there's a powerful image of female magical power, sacredness, spirituality for women involved in this as well. And so I think many, many women have said they are moved to tears when they see hairs. They are drawn to paint them, sculpture them, photograph them. Um, so I've managed to get many artists to consider, who hadn't before, that as well as foxes and wolves and bears and cats and dragons and unicorns and whatever else they might be creating, that hares could be included in that. And now it's become something that uh, is easier to find, but I'm still always delighted to find more. Yeah. I find looking at the image of a sleeping hare is very serene. And when they're resting and they're sort of snoozling down in their little crouched form, I find there's something very simple and enigmatic about them. And yet they always have that ability to run faster than fleeting, you know, any other fleeting feet if they need to. So again, it's, there's something unquantifiable about them. I think there's, there's mystery. Yeah. I think there's mystery. And perhaps more so in than other, other animals that maybe people have encountered. Mm -hmm. Perhaps, perhaps yeah. that's part of it. You mentioned at the beginning that when you were in your old careers that you were already looking into uh, Gardnerian witchcraft mm. and magic. Are you still pursuing your interests in that, studies in that? Or? Well, in the early 80s, having met for the first time somebody who was um, an initiated witch in Gardnerian path tradition, um, that was really the first presentation of of a training that I had encountered um, I'd done some reading generally but I hadn't really found anything else and so it was that moment of, of realizing that this friend that I had known for a year or more had this whole other side to her that I did not know about and at that point I began reading Janet and Stuart Farrer and um, 
various other writers uh, of that time. Monica Hsu, uh, Great Cosmic Mother, Starhawks, The Spiral Dance. Um, I had joined the um, Fellowship of Isis mm -hmm. and attended many gatherings in London. Um, Olivia was alive at that time and uh, was part of many of the gatherings that took place. And I'd really begun at that point a more formal training um, with a view perhaps to initiation at some point. It wasn't really the focus. For me, the interest was in discovering that A, what I felt about the world and its magic, I was not alone. Mm -hmm. That there were not only a handful of others, but hundreds if not thousands of others that shared that. And um, as I say, I was working in entirely unrelated sort of jobs. Um, and then I suppose having again traveled more, I realized that I didn't want to stick specifically with that path for a number of reasons. And although at that point I had undergone an initiation, I decided that having traveled and met people doing many different kinds of spiritual practice from Dianic Wicca to OTO, from people doing uh, Gnostic um, liturgy to people working in a more hedge witchcraft mm -hmm. mode. And I began to realize that really I could, hmm, I don't want to say pick and choose in a, in a, in a superficial way, but that I could combine together what felt meaningful to me and I wasn't really interested in degrees and hierarchy and all of that. I just wanted to feel that I was being true to myself. And so I would call myself now an eclectic witch or an eclectic pantheist, if I bothered yes. to name it at all. Um, and occasionally people have said to me, well, you've had groups, um, you've taught and worked with many people, um, you could call yourself a this or you could call yourself a that. And I think, OK, well, yes, I, luckily I'm not terribly interested in that. That's fine. But, um, yeah, I, I think now people have such breadth of access. And, of course, a lot of it is bilge and hooey. Mm -hmm. And you still have to find good books written by respected people um, to get a balanced view and, and, a, and a realistic one. I have pointed out to people that many websites simply uh, cut and paste and, you know, borrow and steal mm -hmm. from each other and the same errors and the same spelling mistakes will travel <laughs> from one website to another as people just cut and paste and bodge it all together. Why not find a good writer, find somebody whose work is respected? Um, so many wonderful writers now. And Teresa, I was going to say, Teresa Mori, you've Glenny got Kindred, very um, spectacular collection of books for sale here. <laughs> Lots of the books that published by Capel Ban Publishing, books published by Green Magic Publishing, books published by um, many small independent presses, both here and overseas, is really what I try and focus on with books. And we've been so lucky in having so many authors who are friends to the shop sign the books, and that's another nice treat as well. Yes. But, you know, now I would say most people are not having to, as they used to do, 30, 40, 50 years ago, join a, a, a closed group, undergo a very specific format and framework and structure of training with very uh, much regulated attendance and go through that system. And I, I see that there is value in that to a, to a good degree, that it teaches you a discipline and, and a respectfulness and a a process of change that you can't rush. Mm -hmm. You know, it's no good sitting down at a piano and saying, well, I just got it yesterday and I want to play a symphony by next week. You can't do it. You have to go through the stages of learning the notes, getting familiar with the harmony and the rhythms of it, making mistakes, making little tunes up, and gradually, gradually, you can create something more complex. And I think that is true of a magical practice. But now we have more access to more resources, and more ways in which we can create a practice for ourselves. 
you know, it's a, real life is busy and complicated. If I had to commit to attending something now every full moon or every new moon, I would soon give up. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can uh, totally understand that people's lives are, are busy and complex and require them to be many places, you know, many demands. I think there are some things you can't skip. You can't skip life experience and you can't skip noticing how you yourself grow and change. I'm not saying that this should be some kind of modern fast track, but I do think at least now we have more resources in more ways and we can develop our own practice our own way to some degree. Depends yeah. what you want to do, of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, conscious we're taking up a lot of your time, particularly as you've been running the shop all day because I say I did, you know, I'm fine this is a pleasure to me I'm sitting down for a start <laughs> um, but I noted I picked up um, a little leaflet you've got there of your story reading evenings oh yes now now tell us a little bit about that side of your activity this has been so much fun I really I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed doing this since I learned to read at about three, three and a half years old, my mother was a, a, a primary school teacher who specialised in teaching reading. And when I was three, she said, you're very interested in books and you love to sit with me as we read together. I'm now going to start to teach you to read. And with very uh, ingenious and, and simple ways, um, I was a fluent reader very quickly. And the pleasure in books is still my life's blood. And I began reading to my friends in the playground at school, as well as helping them with their reading by the time I was four and a half, five years old. So reading aloud is something that I've always loved to do. Anybody in my life if they've been around me for more than a few hours, there's been something where I've said, oh, I've got to read you this, and I've read them a paragraph of something, whatever it might be. But stories, storytelling, surely is one of the primal things that makes us human beings. Mm -hmm. Maybe other animals have tales to tell and we don't know their language, so we don't know. I would find it highly likely that certain of the bigger-brained ocean creatures, dolphins and whales, who knows, wolves, who knows, bears, who knows what stories they could tell. But as far as we know, for us, it is our way of passing on history, life experience, archetypes of existence, of who we are. And so I've always loved folk tales and fairy tales all my life. And that really was what prompted my initial foray into magic. As I remember asking the question, God, I remember this so well now. See, this is what happens when you ask me a few questions. I remember saying to this friend of mine, where are the gods and goddesses that I have read about in, in Greek and Roman mythology, in Viking mythology, in, in stories from all over the world, they honour gods and goddesses. Where are they now? Who honours them now? And that was the moment that she said, I have a book you might like to read, and handed me what witches do. Um, so the idea of story reading, back to the flyer, yeah. back to the story reading evenings I've been doing. The idea was, would it be feasible to get a room where I could sit down with people and read aloud to them? And would they come and sit and listen? And it seemed like a, a, a mad idea. I didn't know how I would do it. Um, and it came about because I was doing a talk for uh, a, an annual pagan conference that happened in Norwich for about five, six years called the Harvest Moon Gathering. And I was doing a talk on Victorian and Edwardian literature and its very interesting resurgence of interest in pan mm -hmm. and wildness. Mm. And while I was talking about this a curious little subgenre. I was reading extracts from half a dozen different novels to illustrate my talk. Mm. And at the end of the talk, people got up, most of them toddled off, and a few hung back and had a quick chat with me and said they'd enjoyed the talk. Thank you very much. Lovely. But what they'd really liked was the bits where I was reading aloud extracts from the stories. 
and they wanted to know the rest of the story. <laughs> and I thought, well, there's an interesting idea, reading aloud to grown-ups. So, come forward about uh, 10 years or so, maybe, uh, maybe not quite as much as that, I thought of this last year as a way of raising funds for a local charity. Mm -hmm. They had a room, and I said, could I come along and have people come and sit and listen to me read? And they kind of raised their eyebrows and kind of looked <laughs> a little bewildered <laughs> and said, uh, what will you need? And I said, just some chairs <laughs> and a lamp and maybe a glass of water. And they said, OK, um, how many people do you think might come along? And I said, I really don't know. If we could get 10 people, would that make it worth it? And they said, OK, well, look, we won't open the cafe. We'll give you a kettle and we can provide some tea bags and some coffee and maybe a plate of bickies. And if half a dozen people come along and pay, it'll be worth it. Well, we sold out. Within a couple of weeks, 30-odd uh, people had booked. The room was heaving. Um, we did it again in December as a pre-winter solstice theme. Mm -hmm. They opened the cafe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that one sold out. We packed in about 40 people. And then I did another one in March at the Norwich Puppet Theatre, mm -hmm. a wonderful venue, one of only three dedicated puppet theatres in the whole country, and we have one here in Norwich. And I've always loved that space and wanted to support them. I've hired their spaces for events before. And so three weeks ago, just before the spring equinox, we had about 40-odd people pack in to their little studio room and I read stories of love and friendship and the coming of spring. And we had to turn away as many people as we sat down because we had already taken names here mm -hmm. and said to people, tickets are all gone. We'd sold out a month and a half before the event. So now we're going to do two evenings, the 2nd of November and the 9th of November. It's only been a week that the tickets have been out. We've sold half of the tickets for the 2nd of November. And I know that quite a few people who've come to previous ones have booked for this. Um, we still have plenty of tickets for the 2nd and a lot of tickets for the 9th. Um, but I don't know how long they'll be there yes. but for yeah. that for that one because we'll be past the Samhain marker at that point we'll be into the turning of the year and so my theme will be gentle ghosts friendly fairies and walking between the worlds and again it will be a selection of older folk tales and fairy tales and some more contemporary ones perhaps all with those themes I've just really enjoyed sharing because many of these are stories that I've, I've, I've known for many years and grown up with in some instances. And the idea was to revive that sort of tradition that really existed here up until relatively recently. Victorian, Edwardian, mm -hmm. 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Not everyone yep. had TVs even in the yep. 50s. So getting together as, a, as almost like a family group, a friendly group, and the idea that you would listen rather than have the visuals presented to you. So you have your own imaginative way of visualizing the story. And to share a little, something to nibble, something to sip, and have laugh and maybe mop a few tears as somebody did in the last one. And um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I, I plan to do them only, I would say, between the autumn equinox and the spring equinox. I think they are evenings for long, dark nights yes. by yes. lamplight. Yes. And and also, I don't want people to feel bombarded. Oh, she's doing another one. Um, you know, too much. So um, these two in November, which will be not perhaps identical stories each evening, but close. And then... Possibly do one around in Mulk, end of January, mm -hmm. just as the light starts to grow, yes. might be nice. And then that might be it until maybe the following autumn. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We'll have to see what people think. But I've loved the fact that we've raised, we raised nearly £1,000 for the Kinder Cafe, which was the first location for the first two. And we raised £350 nearly for the Puppet Theatre last time. And if we can sell all the seats this time and people buy a 
coffee and a biscuit in the interval, we might raise, you know, double that this November. Yeah. So I'm just happy to do it. I've just had fun sharing. It's been delightful how much feedback I've had from people who've said they found it... Well, one gentleman said life-affirming, which I was very touched by. Other people have just said it's reminded them of stories that they hadn't heard before or heard for mm -hmm. years. Some people told me they had never been read aloud to as children. Mm. One woman said to me, no, never read aloud to, no books. Mm. And so it's been both a revival for some and maybe a, a first experience for others. And the age ranges have gone from sort of eight, nine years old, a, a grown up eight, nine year old yeah. who loved sitting and listening and was perfectly happy uh, to uh, early 90s. <laughs> so a good age range. But yes, it's primarily for adults and older children, I would say. And um, I'm looking forward to November. It's a long way off, but I, I think I think we'll fill both evenings, I hope. <laughs> um, I'm feeling about what the next mythical, magical animal might be, oh. as in the circle of, if you like, angels and dream catchers and um, that there is some strange, perhaps, way that public embrace some mythical concept. I would say it's just going to increase. People love what is magical, even if they don't quite put that word to it. They love the enigma and the mystery and the the imaginativeness. People love dragons. And of course, here in Norwich, Dragon mm. City. Mm. Um, Nigel Pennock's lovely book, Dragons of the West, has a whole chapter just on Norwich. And the Norwich dragon being leafy, leafy winged and leafy tailed. I love her wherever I see those little sculptures and carvings with, with the leaves on. It reminds us of our connection with plant life. So um, I think more and more people become interested in dragons. Fantasy itself is becoming something that is so much bigger than it ever was, partly because of online connections and games that people play, um, but, you know, it's always been there. Many people still love unicorns hugely. There's something, again, it's the wildness and the freedom and, and something very pure and clean and undomesticated and liberated about the idea of a, a, a unicorn running free or found in a forest. And I, I don't know how deeply people think about these things, but I think there is something primal in us as human beings that connects with magical and fantastical animals as much as it might with real animals. You look at the sorcerer of Trois Frères, you look at antlered images of humans, winged humans, humans with flippers and tail, mermaids, mm -hmm. sirens, you look at you look at wood woeses and the mm -hmm. fo and follets and creatures of wildness of leaf and tree. There is something that more and more people, I think, are being drawn to. And I feel that it's the same kind of feeling that is awakening people to save wild places, to clean the ocean, to preserve wilderness and forest. If we do not have these places, what are we? We are concrete creatures. We are boxed in and in the same way as, you know, perhaps it becomes a, a new kind of thing that people think of as in vogue. Somebody asked me the other day about the Japanese tradition of forest bathing. And I said, well, what is it? But simply the pure pleasure of breathing in the air of a forest, of hearing only those quiet sounds, of the fragrance of the tree and the leaf and the crushed bracken under your feet or the mm. smell of, of mushroom and fungi or flower crushing a leaf and smelling it, the stillness and the silence of being in a wild place. It's being given a new name perhaps, but it's the same behavior, mm -hmm. it's the same need that we have. So many people 
still love dolphins and whales. Many people love otters. Many people love images that reflect perhaps a, a, a god or a goddess, uh, a Ganesh, a Ganpati with an elephant head, or a phoenix, or a griffin, um, or just as simple as, as a cat mm -hmm. who might be nagging you at your foot for, for food, but they are still deity, Bastet and other cat mm -hmm. deities around the world. So it's an interesting thing. I see you've got badgers there. Um, yes. They're always an intriguing creature. And I yes. think one of those, sadly, that most people only ever see oh, yes. dead by the yeah. side of the road. Well, same with hedgehogs. Yeah. Yes, I've, I've hunted to find um, beautiful images of badgers and, and owls and, and quite humble creatures, frogs and hedgehogs. Somebody came in not that long ago and said... I don't suppose you have an image of a mole. And I was able to show them the most beautiful design by Bella Bigsby, a hugely talented self-taught artist whose soft lines and ability to almost paint light. I think she's an extraordinary talent. Um, born in Norfolk, lives in California, comes back to visit. And her paintings of quite humble creatures, mice, sparrows, squirrels, um, little creatures of woodland and, um, you know, a little a moth. Um, she paints with a very delicate kind of colour tone of greys and soft browns and I love her style. Yes, badgers are the ancient keepers of the holders of knowledge of the land and they deserve their rightful place in the countryside and it breaks my heart. Uh, the way that, well, that's a whole discussion we yes, won't go yes, into. But, yes. you know, yes, yes the TV I love them. Thing, yeah, I love yeah. them. I think they're extraordinary. And um, so, yes, I've, I've looked and searched for, for many of these things. And I've been lucky enough to meet many artists. And, and if they haven't painted a particular animal, I've often been able to say, <laughs> ever thought of a design featuring a... <laughs> and then maybe six months or a year goes by and they might send something and I think, oh, beautiful, we'll add that, we'll add that, yes. And that's a huge pleasure, yes. <laughs> that's brilliant. Well, it's been fascinating um, listening to you talk and giving us your time yeah. so um naomi of inana's so festival thank you ever so much thank you for letting me burble on <laughs> it's it's good 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 questions good questions thank you <laughs> and we're out of time once again thank you very much for joining us and we'll hope you'll join us again next time for another episode of the weird tales radio show one final thought before we go. There is no physical evidence to say that today is Thursday. All we have is just trust that someone kept count since the first one ever. Interesting idea. Till next week, stay well, stay weird, stay wild. Good night. Black Shuck, the demon dog of East Anglia, is baying at the moon which means it's time for us to go you've been listening to the weird tales radio show with charles christian your weekly fix of ghost stories urban myths witchcraft magic and folklore you can keep in touch with us online at www.weirdtalesradio.com by email to weirdtales at icloud.com and on Twitter at Urban Fantasist. Join us again next week for another edition of the Weird Tales radio show. Good night. <laughs>